President Trump now offering to extend temporary DACA protections in exchange for more than five and a half billion dollars for a border barrier. You can't uh, negotiate by keeping the government hostage. I want five billion for my border wall and in exchange I'll extend DACA and I'll release the kids from cages so they can be free range kids. <laughs> A mob of MAGA hat wearing high school students surrounding a Native American. And I seen that group of people in front of me and I seen the angry faces and, and all of that. I realized I had put myself in a really dangerous situation. This is New Day Weekend with Victor Blackwell and Christy Ford. Good Sunday to you, a non-starter. That's what Democrats called President Trump's offer to reopen the government before he even officially made the offer. Yeah, the president put forward a three-year deal to protect immigrants brought to the U.S. by their parents. And in exchange for that, he'd get his border wall funded. This is a common-sense compromise both parties should embrace. Well, the Democrats did not embrace it. They held the line, urging the president to drop the wall demand and reopen the government. Now, on the other side, hardliners in the president's own party said he had gone too far, offering what they say is an amnesty deal. Okay, so look, what happens next at this point? Let's go to CNN national correspondent Kristen Holmes live at the White House. What are you hearing from there this morning, Kristen? Well, Christine Victor, the hope here is that this will bring both sides to the negotiating table. As they stand, these Democratic bills, as well as this proposal from President Trump, are essentially dead on arrival. Mitch McConnell has said he will not bring anything to the floor that President Trump won't sign off on. President Trump has said he will only sign off on something that is border wall funding, and House Democrats say they aren't proposing any bills that have that funding. Now, as far as the president's proposal goes, uh, Democrats, as you said, calling it a non-starter. Uh, but I want to take a step back here and look at what exactly was in this proposal. And, of course, it is a negotiation. So let's talk about it in terms of what everybody gets. President Trump getting 2,750 border agents, as well as law enforcement professionals, 75 new immigration judges, but still, again, that $5.7 billion for a physical border wall. Democrats getting, as you mentioned, that three years of extended protection for DREAMers and for those with temporary protected services, as well as $805 million in drug detection technology. Now, Democrats, of course, already saying that they don't like this. Many of them actually enraged because of the fact that President Trump is the one who ended that DACA program, the one who ended that TPS program in the first place. Uh, and I want to pull up here a statement from Nancy Pelosi. If you take a look here, I essentially just want to read you the last line. It says, for one thing, the proposal does not include the permanent solution for DREAMers and TPS recipients that our country needs and deserves. So this was really the worst of both worlds for President Trump. Did not move the ball forward on the shutdown. And in addition to that, angered his far right base who was calling this plan amnesty. So the big hope, again, is not necessarily just that we'll open the governor, government immediately, but instead that this at least brings everyone to the negotiating table. Back to you. All righty. Kristen Holmes, thank you so much. All right. We have to fact check the president's speech yesterday because there were several misleading statements. Let's start with this one. There is a humanitarian and security crisis on our southern border that requires urgent action. All right, so in 2018, there were about 397,000 people who were stopped at the southern border. That's near 2017's historic low when the number was around 300,000. Now, let's compare that to the early 2000s when almost a million people were caught every year. Now, this one. Walls are not immoral. In fact, they are the opposite of immoral because they will save many lives and stop drugs from pouring into our country. Okay, so stopping drugs from pouring into the country. The president claimed that heroin alone kills 300 Americans a week, 90 percent of which comes across the southern border. That was his claim. Now, the number is, is correct, the number of deaths. But Trump's claim, the president's claim, that a border wall will prevent this is false because according to the DEA, the majority of heroin that comes across the southern border is smuggled in privately owned vehicles and tractor trailers at legal ports of entry. And here's Glenn Kessler's take on the idea that a wall would help cut crime and drugs. He's the Washington Post chief fact checker. This is what he tweeted. Even after two years of Trump, 
I still am amazed that a line like this would end up in an official speech. Statements with no credibility undermine everything else in the speech. Christy? CNN political commentator Errol Lewis, political anchor for Spectrum News, and CNN senior media correspondent Brian Stelter, host of Reliable Stor Sources. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Everybody with us here Good to morning. have a little conversation. Good to see you on this Sunday. So, Errol, uh, let's listen together here to Congressman Jim Himes because he says he saw a bright spot in all of this. Okay, I apologize. We don't have that, but I want to read to you what he said. It's a non starter. But let's step away because I think there's some good news to be gleaned from this, and that is this. There is a negotiation going on. Errol, the president made this announcement after Pelosi rejected it. Is there a negotiation going on? Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, the congressman is entitled to his optimism, and that's probably a good thing in general in life, I suppose. But uh, the, re <laughs> the reality is the, the Democrats... And the Republicans are very far apart, and there's very little room to see where they're going to sort of uh, get together. I mean, what would probably be a more realistic uh, 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 attitude, I think, is that uh, the American people are not going to allow the government to remain shut for too much longer. Uh, the trash piling up in the national parks, the humanitarian problems, Coast Guard families showing up at uh, bread lines, nonprofit organizations not getting uh, the resources they need for things like feeding seniors and increasingly uh, low-income families, it's simply not going to be sustainable much longer. And I think that's probably the only good news that to me suggests that they're going to arrive at some kind of accommodation in the near future. Mm. Yeah, they, they have to for these people. Brian, let's listen to the president because there is one thing he said that has, you know, might be having people say, mm, are we moving? Oh, are we evolving here in some way? Listen to this, mm. what he said about the wall. This is not a 2,000-mile concrete structure from sea to sea. These are steel barriers in high-priority locations. Okay, so he's backing down on the wall, the wall, the wall, the wall, not from one side to the other necessarily. But is there a possibility that that is going to move the needle in any way? Well, I'll say something I very rarely say, Christy. Trump is being more honest uh, on this particular issue. Uh, typically, there's a lot of dishonesty when he's talking about immigration. He's trying to be very threatening with his language. But he is being more honest about what Border Patrol agents actually want and what is actually realistic at the border. Obviously, there's already lots of barriers all across the border. Then there's lots of areas without, bo uh, without barriers. Trump wants more barriers instead of the wall, which is a made-up concept that was invented in order to keep him uh, 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 kind of on his message on the campaign trail in 2015. He is talking in a more honest way about what would actually be installed here. 230 miles of barrier according to this budget proposal. Uh, I think he was trying to set the Sunday agenda by giving this speech on Saturday afternoon, but I'm, I'm really not sure where it worked. As you mentioned uh, in the setup here, we're already seeing some of Trump's far right wing supporters criticize him. Uh, Ann Coulter, for example, mm -hmm. saying we voted for Trump but we got Jeb instead. And, and Ann Coulter's not the only one saying that. Uh, Steve King, the congressman, has been in the news recently for being denounced for his racist statements. He is calling this proposal amnesty, and he is criticizing Trump for it. Other far-right figures are as well. And the headline on the New York Times front page this morning says, Trump's trying to go beyond his base, but no one is happy as a result. So I, I wonder if he's going to react to the backlash to this proposal he has set out. In the meantime, let's be honest, this program, New Day, is doing more to show leadership than the government right now. Obviously, you know, Victor's call yesterday for yep. food banks to try to get people to donate to food banks. That's the kind of thing and that is did. leadership. And they did in huge numbers. The president didn't even acknowledge those workers yesterday in his speech. He didn't even acknowledge the pain and suffering this shutdown is causing in his speech yesterday. So here's the other thing, Errol, as we watch all of this play out. President Trump promised change in Washington. Yet you're, he's saying you cannot have uh, any shutdown uh, being alleviated without my border. The two don't go together. They, 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 when you're putting two separate issues in one bill, hmm. that is not a change in Washington, is it? Well, it, it's certainly disruption. That was the big thing that he did promise coming into office, was that he's going to shake things up, and those who right. voted for him said they, we need to uh, end business as usual. Well, we have ended business as usual. We have ended business of all kind. We have shut down <laughs> the government. Uh, the, the president now is trying to, right, substantively negotiate the wall, 
at the same time is this increasingly larger issue of what to do with hundreds of thousands of federal workers and their families who are now going through these kind of uh, personal problems as well as the larger economic crisis that spills out from it. So uh, this is what the president wanted. I don't think anybody who supported him could, could claim to be surprised at this point. And of course, looming over all of this is, put aside the fact that Mexico was supposed to pay for this wall, looming over all of this is why during the last two years when there was unified Republican control, why wasn't he going on television? Why wasn't he offering these kinds of deals? Why, on the other hand, were Republicans, including those from, from uh, border districts, mm. consistently rejecting these ideas? Mm. Errol Lewis, Brian Stelter, we appreciate both of you gentlemen so much. Thank you for being Thanks. here. Thanks. And listen, Brian is around. Stelter is going to be here, of course, for Reliable Sources later this afternoon, 11 a.m. Eastern, today, right here on CNN. President Trump's attorney, Rudy Giuliani, is Jake Tapper's guest later this morning on State of the Union. Also joining Jake, 2020 hopeful Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, State of the Union at 9 at noon, right here on CNN. There is a disturbing video out there online that shows a group of teens harassing a Native American elder and Vietnam War veteran. It's gone viral. That veteran is speaking to CNN. What he said. Plus, several homes destroyed. The people who lived there pulled from the wreckage after a tornado. Yes, a tornado in mid-January ripped through the southeast. We'll have the latest. Well, a Native American elder and Vietnam War veteran is talking to CNN after a disturbing viral video shows a group of teens harassing and mocking him in Washington. Here's the video that's uh, garnering so much outrage online. Nathan Phillips, he's on the right, uh, beating his drum and singing an uh, American Indian protest song. This was Friday on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial when he saw a clash erupting uh, between a group of teenagers and four African-American young men, he says, are preaching about the Bible and oppression. Phillips says he immediately sensed danger. When I was there and I was standing there and I seen that group of people in front of me and I seen the angry faces and, and all of that, I, I realized I had put myself in a really dangerous situation, you know. It was like, here's a group of people who were angry at somebody else and I put myself in front of that and all of a sudden I'm the one who's all that anger and all that wanting to have the freedom to just rip me apart you know that was scary that and and i i'm a vietnam times veteran and and i know that mentality of there's enough of us we can do this well then phillips described the the moments he said they were pretty tense uh, that you're seeing that are being played over and over online when a young man got right in his face. This is what he said about that. When I started going forward and that mass of groups of people started separating and, and, and separating and moving aside to allow me to move out of the way or to proceed, this young fella put himself in front of me and wouldn't move. And so I could, if I took another step, I would be, putting my my person into his presence into his space and I would have touched him and that would have been the the thing that the group of people would have needed to spring on me well CNN Sarah Seidner asked Phillips you know what bothered him most about Friday's confrontation fear not for myself but fear for the next generation, fear where this country is going, fear for their, those youths, fear for their future, fear for their souls, their spirit, their, their what they're going to do to this country. What they were doing wasn't making America great. It was just tearing down the fabric that was that the whole idea, the spirit of America, that wasn't it, you know. Well, newly elected Representative Deb Holland is among the first Native Americans elected to Congress, and she, she reacted on Twitter uh, this way. This veteran put his life on the line for our country. 
The students' display of blatant hate, disrespect, and intolerance is a signal of how common decency has decayed under this administration. Heartbreaking. Now, CNN did reach out to the school that the teens attend. The school hasn't returned any phone calls, voicemails, or emails just yet. But they did delete their Facebook page and block the Twitter page. Uh, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Covington has condemned the actions. I don't know what you're seeing outside uh, your window right now, but take a look at what's happening in Alabama. Just wild weather slamming not only the southeast, but the northeast. And we're hearing reports of tornadoes. Yes, tornadoes in January with some damaging winds whipping across Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. But that is one street in Alabama. Yeah, and so while you're seeing all this in the south, there's an inch of ice and uh, an additional foot of snow that's causing problems in the Northeast. CNN meteorologist Allison Chinchaw in the CNN Weather Center with the latest. How often do we see tornadoes in mid-January in the South? It's rare, although if it's going to occur, it was likely to be in the southeast. But again, even for the, this area, it is rare in January. Their peak is actually more in the spring, March, April, May, those typical months. But we did. We had actually not one, but three reported tornadoes from this system that slid through yesterday. Numerous wind reports uh, causing tree limbs and things like that to come down as well. But we also had storm reports further north from the same system, but those were a different type of report. Those were actually snow reports and some of them quite significant. Two Rivers, Wisconsin, which is just on the side of Lake Michigan, picking up over a foot of snow. The Buffalo Airport in New York picking up nearly a foot of snow. The key there is that it's still snowing across much of upstate New York, including areas of Buffalo. It's also snowing heavily across areas of Vermont and New Hampshire. Ice, freezing rain, sleet for places like Massachusetts, New York, as well as Connecticut. We do still expect additional snow on top of what we've already had. The highest amounts are going to be for portions of interior New England and especially off to the north. Ice is also still going to come down and accumulate for cities like Portland, stretching down towards Boston, and it could be an additional half of an inch on top of what has already fallen. This will still likely cause travel delays for places like Boston and New York even today and potentially tomorrow. Because look at this, Victor and Christy, see all this cold air coming in? That is going to keep all that snow and all that ice in place for days. Not to mention, look at this, over 50 million people under a wind chill advisory going forward because of how cold those temperatures are going to be in the next 24 hours. Wow. All right, buckle up there. All Allison. the good news Allison Chinchar has yeah. for us this morning. I All know. this good news. <laughs> uh, just stay in, less yes. fire, you know, stay in your PJs, you're allowed, right? Uh, that is not what CNN correspondent Polo Sandoval is doing. No. He might be in his PJs under that. I don't have any idea under that coat, but he's in Hartford, Connecticut. <laughs> and uh, he, I don't know if he's going to want to get out of the car, but how are the roads there this morning, Polo? <laughs> Yeah, that's right, uh, Christy and Victor. Let's get you some pictures now to go with the description that Allison just laid out for you. This, These are the streets of Hartford, Connecticut, as you mentioned. If people aren't iced in, they are certainly uh, snowed in, in in some parts of the city here. We have seen snow plows working through the night and this morning. So far, of course, they focus on some of the main streets, not necessarily on some of these neighborhood roads. But yes, uh, you will see them from time to time. Uh, the main warning right now that's coming from officials, throughout, not just here in Hartford, but really throughout uh, the Northeast, where millions of people are being affected by this, is to stay inside if you can. Of course, we're able to use our roving coverage vehicle to safely provide you these kinds of pictures of what the situation is like for many people uh, here in the Northeast. None of the snow was here yesterday. The snow moving in overnight and then turned into uh, uh, some of that precipitation, which uh, froze. And that's a big concern here. Those frigid temperatures, it is what comes after the snowstorm that really worries people because, of course, there's that potential for ice, not just on limbs, on tree limbs, but also on power lines. And that is why for the last few days, we've seen utility crews uh, staged throughout the Northeast, ready to move in when and if some of those blackouts begin to be reported. Finally, I should mention, bringing it back here to Connecticut, where uh, Ned Lamont, the governor of the state, activated his emergency operations center. It is active right now as he monitors the situation. But again, the main warning from everybody, Christy and Victor, uh, from officials, you don't have to be out in this. Stay home. It's a Sunday morning. Yeah. And you're not in your PJs under all that. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, might want to be, though. Thank you, Paul. Paul Sandoval. Thanks you so bet. much.
<laughs> All right, uh, it was President Trump versus Congress on Saturday Night Live in Deal or No Deal Government Shutdown Edition. Earlier today, you went on TV and you told the American people that you want to make a deal. That's right, Steve. All right, so we decided to do this in the only format that you can understand. A TV game show with women holding briefcases. <laughs> All right, today starts another week without any guarantee of a paycheck for federal workers because of this partial government shutdown. President Trump has offered the Democrats a deal, temporary legal protections for DREAMers in exchange for full funding, uh, the $5.7 billion for his border barrier. The Democrats say they're not buying, though. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi calling the proposal a non-starter. Now, as lawmakers in Washington quibble, Saturday Night Live has their own spin on the shutdown. In your briefcase here, you got the deal that Congress offered you in December. And I said, no deal. Yeah, nobody's excited about that play. Uh, what was your counter offer today? I want five billion for my border wall, and in exchange, I'll extend DACA, and I'll release the kids from cages so they can be free-range kids. Okay, my offer is whatever you want. No, Chuck, Chuck, we're not doing that anymore. Remember, we're not caving in. Oh, right, right. Yeah, projecting strength. Okay, let me put on my fiery red cheetahs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my new offer is $15 and a pastrami on rye, you know. Okay, deal or no deal, Mr. President. And remember, every time you choose no deal, half a million federal employees work another day without getting paid. Uh, Cool story, bro. No deal. <laughs> All righty, CNN's Brian Stelter with us now. Brian, they always seem to cleverly figure out how to make it happen. And I was wondering who was going to be playing uh, Nancy Pelosi yeah. and Chuck Schumer. Uh, now that the Democrats uh, do have some power in Washington, SNL is adapting to that. But I thought Deal or No Deal was the perfect framing uh, to look at the shutdown. You know, SNL had been off for a month, so uh, they hadn't weighed in on the shutdown yet. This was really the perfect way to do it. Uh, and, of course, this is all coming on the exact two-year anniversary of President Trump's inauguration. I'm starting to think government shutdowns are his anniversary present or his anniversary wish or something because if you think back to the one-year anniversary of President Trump's inauguration, this day last year, we were also in a government shutdown. That one, of course, was very short compared to this very long one that we are going through now. But two years in a row, the government shut down on the anniversary of President Trump's inauguration. Look, I'm just glad the SNLs of the world are around to make us laugh. Think about what happened this week. Burger King made fun of the president. Burger King, a hamburger chain. They put out a tweet making fun of Trump for misspelling hamburgers on Twitter. And Burger King wasn't the only brand out there uh, having fun at the president's expense. Netflix announced a comedy based on the idea of a space force. You know, the president talks about wanting a space force. Netflix is going to do a show all about the workers of the space force. So you have all these companies, all these comedians having fun with this stuff. Look, I just want to say thank you for making us laugh at what is otherwise a very serious time. Yeah, it certainly is. And SNL, we know, can move mm -hmm. public opinion that on people true. and policy. That Brian Stelter, true. thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. So the government shutdown, of course, uh, it's affecting service projects at national parks across the country for this weekend, for the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And it's really hitting home for the family itself this year. Martin Luther King III joins us next, along with uh, his daughter, Yolanda King. They'll be with us in a moment. When I tell people my story, they don't believe it, but it's true. I've always thought, what would it be like if you turned the corner one day and you saw yourself? Oh my God. Wow. The first time that the boys met the three together, it was a miracle. There was nothing that can keep us apart. That's when things kind of got funky. Something was just not right. I'd like to know the truth. There was always a question mark. The parents had never been told. They're trying to conceal what they did from the people they did it to. There's still so much that we don't know. How could you not tell us? 
three identical strangers next Sunday at 9 Eastern on CNN. 22 minutes until the top of the hour. The nation is preparing to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Now, Atlanta's National Historical Park honoring Dr. King was initially partially closed because of the government shutdown. It's a national park, but it was reopened in time for the holiday thanks to a grant from Delta Airlines. Now, there are other national parks across the country <coughs> that are affected by the shutdown. It's derailed some day of service projects that were supposed to happen in those parks. Well, Martin Luther King III, the eldest son of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and his daughter, Yolanda Renee King, the granddaughter of Dr. King, with us now. Thank you both for being Thank here. You. Thank you. So I wanted to ask you um, about, about the fact that Delta stepped up and, and opened uh, these parts of the center that were going to be closed. What did that mean to you when you heard that? Can you take, take us into that moment? Well, number one, num number one um, uh, I'm not sure we knew that that was going to happen. Uh, I think Bernice perhaps had been in dialogue and others. So it, it is remarkable that that is able to happen because uh, the holiday doesn't change its date. It's coming, and it's going to be here Monday and looming large. And I think uh, we'll be open through uh, the Super Bowl, but hopefully the government will be open way before then. And hey Martin, there was a moment I saw that was tweeted out um, on which your sister became a little emotional at the start of the week in talking about the center um, you know, preparing for the week celebration, but that some of the uh, park services workers would not be there to celebrate potentially because of, of the shutdown. What are your feelings about uh, this shutdown, those workers, and their importance to the operation of the center that, that pays tribute to your father? Well, we have had a long-term relationship with the National Park Service, and it's almost like family. So you feel like uh, your family is not able to partake in the activity. So this is phenomenal that this has happened. And uh, so it's easy to, easy to understand why one can become emotional, because it's almost like saying, well, they can't be there, although they've been there all of these years. So uh, this, this is actually incredible. All right, Yolanda, I want to get you in the conversation here, and I want to play just a little bit for, to remind our viewers here of part of your speech last year at March for Our Lives when you were just nine years old. Let's listen together here. My grandfather had a dream that his four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that enough is enough. So when you look back at that, Yolanda, if you could be back on that stage today, is there anything, what, what, what would you say if you were standing on the stage today in front of all of those people? Would you say anything differently? I'd probably say the same because, but maybe a little bit more because situations are happening more like everywhere and instead of things getting better, things are getting um, a little more out of control and we need to settle down. Yolanda, your dad tweeted out a video um, earlier this month, uh, just a couple of days ago, actually. And this was a video that was recorded um, back in August at the 55th anniversary of your grandfather's I Have a Dream speech. And you were with uh, some kids at the border in San Diego. And you said it was important to be there on that anniversary. Why was it important for you to be with kids at the border on the 55th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech? Well, my parents and I decided that um, we wanted to spend the 50th anniversary and 55th anniversary um, at the border to help the children of all what's going on. And so we decided to go up there and we decided to meet kids that were about our age. We didn't get to meet the kids in the cages because they were at school, but we did get to meet some kids from schools that went up there and visited with us and we had a little ceremony. Martin, as a father, listening to your daughter talk about this and, and what she has seen and what is her hope, uh, what you have seen together, as a father, talk to us about what that does to you. Well, it, it, number one, uh, you, don't, you want your child to develop in the best way that they can. And my wife and I have not put pressure on Yolanda. 
we want, if Yolanda already has her own mind made up from day one, when she was very small, she was very interested in homelessness and eradicating homelessness. Uh, she's always been interested in injustice. And so it, we are so grateful and thankful because she's the only grandchild of Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. And so she already has a spirit of activism within. And that certainly makes us feel very, very good. Uh, we're not going to push her at all, but we want to support her in whatever way we can. And hopefully it will manifest itself in some level of a leadership role. Martin, the holiday, uh, as you know, obviously, is tomorrow. Um, what's the best way, from your family's perspective, to pay tribute, to honor the work, the memory, the legacy of Dr. King? Well, my mom uh, often said that it really is a day on, not a day off. So although it's a holiday, which means uh, maybe kick back and relaxing, it really is more of a day that we should be engaged in service, and particularly, particularly this year. Uh, I don't know how we got to the point where we would stop paying workers, our government would shut down. If someone wants to build a wall, we can build a wall and people can work at the same time. I don't understand how we got to this point and I don't understand why we've not resolved it. It seems as if Congress could override a veto of a president as a president and, and still be able to work on a wall if that's what the president wants to do at some point. But it's very tragic. It feels very bad to go through airports. It feels bad. Our Coast Guard is not working. Our first line of defense, they're not being paid. I mean, something has got to change and give for the United States of America. We are far better than the behavior we're exhibiting. And so I think we got to be engaged in all kinds of service throughout this holiday and really throughout the year, not just uh, this year, which is dad's dad would have been 90 years old. It's hard mm. to imagine he would have been 90. Yeah. So not a day off, but a day on. Yeah. Day I off. like that. Martin Luther King III, Yolanda Renee King, thank you both for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, listen, as we talk about the holiday, mm. we talk about equality, there was a lot of anger online and calls for boycotts this week when razor company Gillette released what is now a viral ad. The ad actually, is it attacking men? Is it calling out toxic masculinity as has been the criticism? Coming up, we're talking with a community organizer who works in violence prevention.